Well, hello everyone and welcome back to another Sunday School Review. We're going to jump into God's Word and see what we can get from the Word to apply to our everyday life. And the Word is absolutely full of power and authority. And I think that the problem is down through the years, we've not, we don't really uh, take the time to understand the, the immutability of God's Word and the power that God's Word has in our lives and how I could change everything if we just only believe in the power of the word. It's, uh, it's pretty amazing. So the, today, the subject is a full assurance. Hebrews chapter 6, verses 9 through verse 20. And so we're going to kind of dive right in. The lesson is broken down into two different sections today. One is promise made, Hebrews 6, 9 through 12. And uh, declaration is verse 9, source is 10a, and basis is 10b through 12. And then the next part of our lesson is uh, promise fulfilled. And uh, by God's greatness, verses 11, verses 13 through 15, by, by God's faithfulness, verses 16 through 20. And so I'm going to give a little, just a little bit of context and, and read that part. Then we we'll get into a verse by verse exposition here. So let me get that, get that pulled up real quick here. The lesson context gives us, I think, well, the context of our lesson. And the book of Hebrews is unique in the collection of New Testament letters in that the author's name is never mentioned. Uh, is not made known at least. And the passage in the passage of time alluded to in Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 12 is thought to indicate that a second generation of believers uh, is in view. The word remember that you see in, uh, in Hebrews 13 and 7, 13 and 7, is taken to support this proposal as the verse challenges, challenges Challenge, challenges the original audience to recall uh, instructions from the leaders of the first generation of believers. This theory is possible as long as the word remember is intended to mean recall information from memory. But the Greek word translated remember can also keep, can mean keep on thinking, uh, as it seems to intend in Hebrew, Hebrews 11 and 15. There, the same underlining Greek word is translated mindful. In any case, the many references uh, to the priesthood, a whole lot of them in the Old Testament, uh, personality, you see this in he personality, you see this in Hebrews chapter 11, and it point to an, points to an audience of Jewish backgrounds. And there are various ways to outline the book of Hebrews, and you see this in your Sunday school um, context in the, the New International Version. I won't read all that for the sake of time. So we're going to kind of get right on into it here for today. I'm gonna, I want you to see the verses that we're going to, to read in Hebrews chapter 6, starting at verse 9. But beloved, we, have, we are persuaded better things of you and things that accompany salvation though we do speak. For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love, which ye have ministered to the saints and do minister. And we, declare, and we desire that every one of you do show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope unto the end, that you be not slothful but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promise, promises. For when God, when God made promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no greater, he swore by himself, saying, Surely blessing I will bless thee, and multiplying I will multiply thee. And so after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. 
for men bearing the square by the greater and oath and an oath for confirmation is to them an end of all strife. Wherein God willing uh, more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel confirmed it by an oath that by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation who have fled from, for refuge to lay hold upon hope, uh, the hope set before us, which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which entered into that within the veil, whether the forerunner uh, is for us entered, whether the forerunner is for us entered, even Jesus made an high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. And in your Sunday school lesson, you're going to see uh, this image in your, or this picture rather, in your Sunday school lesson. It's a very, very powerful picture. Hope in Christ anchors us. And that should be the case for all of us. Hope in Christ should anchor all of us. And so now we're going to get into a little bit more detail. And uh, we use the same thing we've used for years. The, the Sunday school commentary is almost like a, it's almost like a, a course, a Bible course in the word of God. It has so much information. And so I would encourage you to follow along as we go uh, to the commentary here. And in the first part, we're talking about promises made in the first part of our lesson. And in that first subtopic is declaration in verse 9. In verse 8, right before this verse, the writer wraps up uh, what's called the negative cautions uh, and switched to a discussion in verse 9 to the anticipation of better things. And in making the transition, the writer uh, is not denying the relevance of the warnings that you read about in Hebrews chapter 6, verse 4 through 8. And Hebrews chapter 10, verse 26 to 28. Those are not being uh, denied. Uh, the word beloved, however, speaks to the, 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 the close personal connection between the writer. We got to say the writer because the, the writer is, not, is unknown or not stated, at least. We don't know who it is. Some say it may have been Paul, but we don't, I don't, I don't have any, any um, real research personally that says it was Paul, but uh, some say uh, it sounds like Paul's writings. And there was a, there was a close connection between Paul and the, or the writer and the audience. And so then we see in verse 10a, we see the source. Uh, and so in using uh, the description, not unrighteous, you read this in verse 10a, the writer uses a form of the delivery known as uh, latotes. You see that in your commentary. This is the, the kind of delivery that the writer is using here. And this happens when a writer or speaker creates an understatement, an understatement by, by, by stating a positive by means of a negative to the contrary. So in saying something like good uh, by declaring not bad, let me say it again, by saying something is good by declaring it's not bad. So the fact communicated here is that God is righteous by saying he's not unrighteous. It is it's saying that he's righteous. So the belief of God's righteousness is connected to the fact that he's not unrighteous to forget. And that's, and you know, we all, we all know that that's, that's real, real good news. Then in verse 10 B, the recipients of this letter uh, had ministered, in ways that clearly witness to their salvation. Although salvation is by grace through faith and not by works, Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 89, we also know that good works are a result of salvation. So when we're born again, uh, we ought to show some signs. And when we're born again, we will show some signs because salvation uh, it results in doing the right thing. And Jesus said that the world would know him. Look at what Jesus said. The world would know his followers by their love for one another. So how does the world know that we are on the Lord's side? By the way we love one another and the way we treat one another. 
And uh, so that's, I want you to read John, John 13 and 35 uh, to that reference. The love we demonstrate is a result of grace, the grace and the forgiveness that we receive from Jesus. So since he gave us all this grace and forgiveness, we should also show grace and forgiveness and love for one another. Then the phrase show toward his name indicates that ministry is to be done, listen to this now, as if it's actually, actually being done for Jesus. We're not working for a man. We're not working for an assembly. We're not working for a board or a body. We're working for Jesus. When it comes down to ministry, we're working for Jesus. And really we should do all things as unto the Lord. I want to read Matthews 25 and 40. So the author uses uh, the past and present tense verbs in this verse, in this, this, this portion of, of the 10th verse, 10b. Have minister and do minister, past and present tense, to acknowledge the work of the believers and to acknowledge that the work of the believers were consistent in living out their faith. Faith has to be lived out, class. This is not something we just, an exercise of futility. It has to be lived out. In verse 11, we see the basis. We're still talking about here the, the promises made. And in verse 11 here, we see the basis of the promise. So here we see the writer's concern for consistent, and the commentary really kind of dives a little deep here, consistent and continuous pastoral care. And this was not only for the benefit of the, of the one receiving the care, but also evident of the recipients. The word says, show the same diligence to the full assurance, which is our subject, full assurance of hope unto the end. In order to make certain that, we, that what, we hope, what we hope for will come true. The Apostle Paul saw life as a race. We're all in a race, but the race has to be finished. We got to finish the race for the hope of the reward. Matter of fact, let me read. Uh, I want you to go back. I don't have time. You go back and read First Corinthians chapter nine, verse twenty-four through twenty-seven, and Second Timothy chapter four, verse seven and eight. In verse twelve, we see uh, the underlining Greek word for slothful in that verse. The word slothful appears here in this verse here, verse twelve. And and in Hebrews chapter five verse eleven, where where the the, the translation of the word uh, slothful is the word dull, which is a warning which which warns against failing to to hear. And some you, you've heard folks say, "Boy, I, I don't talk to you till I'm blue in the face," and you still don't hear what I'm saying. I've talked to you until I'm blue in the face, and you still don't hear what I'm saying dull of hearing. That's a warning not to be dull of hearing. So the author then hopes the reader, the reader will both hear and minister according to the truth. Let me read James chapter 1 and verse 22. James 1, 22. Let's see here. I'm going to read this in the, in the New Living Translation. But don't, don't just listen to God's word. You must do what it says. Otherwise, you're only fooling yourselves. And nobody wants to fool themselves. So the reader then, the readers are encouraged to follow the example of those who have been faithful in ministry. It's one thing to be in ministry class. It's altogether something different to be, uh, to be faithful in ministry. And that's why we all got to work on this on a regular basis, which is why also accountability to somebody is so very important. Let me read 1 Corinthians 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 6. I'm going to read this in, New, in the New Living Translation. Dear brothers and sisters, I've used Apollos and myself to illustrate what I've been saying. If you pay attention to what I have quoted from the scriptures, you won't be proud of one of your leaders at the expense of another. Then in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1, Paul says, and you should, and you should imitate me just as I imitate Christ. You're not just trying to be like me just to be like me, but you want to be like me because I want to be like Christ. I'm imitating Christ. Therefore, 
uh, I serve as a good pattern is what Paul is saying here, a good example for you to imitate me. Then in verses uh, 13, we see promises fulfilled. We're getting into the second part of our lesson here. Promises fulfilled by God's greatness. So the emphasis here is on God. Whom, what the word says, who made a promise to Abraham. You see this in Genesis chapter 22, verses 15, verses 15 through 18. But we should also know that making a vow or swearing an oath is really the same thing. And you read about this in our commentary. You want to read this in Psalms 132 and 2, and also in, in Numbers chapter 30, verse 2, and verse 10 in Numbers 30. It was permissible in the Old Testament era to swear by the name of Israel's God because he was the only true God. Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 13 and Isaiah chapter 65 verse 16. Thus when, we, thus when God uh, himself makes a promise or swears an oath, he must swear by himself because nobody is greater than him. That is so deep to me. That's so amazing. There's, no, there's nobody that he can swear to to confirm that what he's saying uh, is, is true that's greater than he is, so he, got to, he had to swear by himself. Man, that is amazing. I want you to read Isaiah chapter 45 and verse 23. So this is a reminder then of God's promise and that God's promises are yea and amen because his greatness confirms his own word. God's greatness is the confirmation. So by taking, uh, by take, the taking of vows and swearing of oaths, I mean, in, in the Old Testament, was misused in that first century. As, as, as the traditions of man displace God's word, the result was what? But what does man do today? Self-serving. Self-serving oaths and vows. And Jesus condemned these self-serving oaths and vows. I want you to read Matthew 5, uh, chapter 5, verses 33 through 37, and chapter 15, verses 4 through 6. This lesson is, a real, is, is one to make you really think, and you can't just go through it real quick because it's too much information to zip through it. So you got to really read it and then read it again and read it again. So in verse 14 and 15, we see now uh, the promises are fulfilled by God's greatness. While 75 years old, Abraham called Abram in Haran. Well, at, at 75 years old, God had promised him many descendants at 75 years old. At 75, he didn't have any, but God promised him many. I want you to read Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 4. And God, God started fulfilling that promise 25 years later. Now, he's 75 at this prior. So 25 and 75, we all know, is 100. At 100 years old, Abraham fathered a child because God's word is true. Now, somebody else is wrong, but God's word is true, and God's word, God's word cannot lie. Genesis chapter 21 and 5. So my goodness, we get, oh, if, we, if we just lean and depend on God's word and know how powerful God's word is, a lot of things that we deal with we just kind of we really go away because we know God's word cannot lie and it never fails. It always accomplishes what it says it's going to accomplish. Abraham's main task, his main job during those 25 years was to wait, to trust, and obey. Wait, trust, and obey. But after 11 years of waiting, Abraham and Sarah decided they're going to try and help God uh, with, with the conception and birth of Ishmael. So his wife told him to go in. Well, we, we don't look like we're going to get that done, so go ahead and go to my maid and get her pregnant, and it would be like my child. Well, that ain't what God told them to do. How many of us get in trouble trying to, trying to help God out? to go beyond God's will and God's way and, and do it our own way. But in time, Abraham learned. He learned patience over the next uh, additional 14 years or so 
until the birth of Isaac. Isaac, the promised child, was, was born when Abraham was again 75 years old. His wife was, they was way, way up in age. So it was, it was a miracle that God uh, used them and allowed them to give birth to a child and him to father a child at that age. And by the first century AD, many Jews believed that just being, now this is what's amazing, uh, as time progressed, Jews believed that just being a descendant of Abraham made them right with God, just by, because they were, were his descendant, Father Abraham, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The Jewish nation came from, this, this is how they descended. So many Jews felt that because of that, we all right. I want you to read Matthews 3 and, and 9. But what was, what was the most important thing in terms of connection with God was not, was not the biological or physical connection to the Jewish nation, but the spiritual descendants of Abraham. That was, what, that was what was more and most important. I want you to read what Paul said about this in Galatians chapter 3, verses 7 through 9. We also see here in verse 16 and 17 promises fulfilled. In verse 16, verse 16 reflects Exodus chapter 22, verses 10 and 11. A person swearing an oath in that context was inviting God to be a witness. You have folks that God is my witness. I did never go down there. God is my witness. I never said that. God is my witness. I never did that. When they're saying God is my witness, they, they just inviting God to be on the witness stand. Is that is what he is what he's saying is true. So 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 swearing an oath then in that context in Exodus chapter 22, verse 10 and 11 invites God to witness the truth of the testimony. You know, I was a child, we used to say things like, say God heaven truth. We say it real fast. God heaven truth. Say God heaven truth. They were saying, say God heaven's truth. And when we say God heaven's truth, my brother or me, or if I said it, my brother said it, or somebody else said it, and that we knew about that, we said, okay, he's telling the truth then because he said God's heaven truth. And some folks say, I swear for God, I swear for God. So what they're saying is, God is my witness. And but nowadays, folks say, God, heaven, truth, uh, they, swear, they swear before God and still lie. Ain't that something? No conscience. And so um, this served to put, what the word calls, it served to put, the word says, an end to all strife. And in the case at hand, in Genesis 21, I want you to, want you to read, well, let me just read Genesis 21 and 23. We got a little time. Genesis 21 and 23 says this. I'm going to read this in the New Living Translation. Swear to me in God's name that you will never deceive me, my children or any of my descendants. I have been loyal to you, so now swear that you would be loyal to me and to this country where you, where you are living as a foreigner. Here's a person that wanted Abraham to give him, a, give him a, his word by swearing that I've been good to you just, and you, I want you to swear you're going to be good to me and you're going to be good to my, my family. And so the idea here is that the people, that people take an oath, taking oaths, uh, O-A-T-H-S, in light of someone who is greater, is, and, and listen to this, it ain't nothing greater and ain't no one greater than, 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 than God. He is supreme. He is sovereign. He is almighty. There's no supreme court justice over God. God is supreme. God is superior. God is sovereign. And we, we, can, uh, we can lean and depend on him. We just got to learn how to lean and depend on him. So in taking the oath, God communicated on man's ability to understand because God ain't got to take no oath to nobody, but when he took an oath, this is how man understand the, the, the validity and the stability and the surety of the word being promised. And so now there would be no doubt regarding his intention and commitment to implement his plan. God has a plan and God has a plan for every, every human being. Uh, in this world, God has a plan. We just got to learn the plan of God. And so, and, and this is reflected in the, the, in, the in, in immutability 
But the word says immutability of his counsel. The word immut immutable means unchanging. God's word does not change for man. Man's got to change for God's word. And in verse 18, we see still the promises fulfilled. And in verse 18, God's by God's faithfulness. God is faithful. Now, now human beings, man has to work on being faithful, but God is faithfulness is who he is. God is faithful. In verse 18, we see we see an affirmation of the fact that it was impossible for God to lie. Let me read Numbers, Numbers 23 and 19. I'm going to read this in, in the New Living Translation. God is not a man, so he, so he does not lie. He is not human, so he does not change his mind. Has never, and, and has, he has ever spoken. Let me read it again. He is not human, so he does not change his mind. He has ever spoken and failed to, he has ever spoken and failed to act? That's the question. Has he ever spoken and failed to act? No, he has not. He has, has he ever promised and not carried it through? No, he has not. God's word is true. God's word is right. God, God's word is consistent. And he has never lied and cannot lie. And there's one, and, and that, that is one that he can't lie. That's one of the, the two immutable things in view in the verse at hand. Not only that, God sealed the promise with an oath. And we should also note that an important goal of the writer is to prevent people from falling away from Christ. That's one of the main, the main goals he has because to fall away from Christ and to, to leave him is to crucify him afresh all over again, publicly crucify him again. I want you to read Hebrews chapter six, verses four through six. And, and, and the absolute reliability of God's word is going to serve to achieve that goal that people don't just fall away. That's the whole idea is to prevent, to stop folks from getting to know who Jesus is and then leaving him altogether. Now I want you to, but we want to bring to a close now in verse 19 and 20. We're talking about God's, still by, by God's faithfulness. Promises fulfilled, how? By God's faithfulness. We see the word anchors. The word anchors, uh, anchor, anchors, makes us think about or brings thoughts to mind of stability and illustrates and illustrates Christian's hope, the hope of the Christian. In the Old Testament, that the, the second veil was the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all. I want you to read Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 3 and also verse 7. And also read Exodus chapter 26 and verse 33. The word also records that the temple's veil was torn from top to bottom when Jesus died on the cross. I want you to read uh, Matthew 27 and verse 51. And, it, and then that, that whole concept is explained a whole lot more in Hebrews chapter 10, um, verses 19 through 25. I would encourage you to read, uh, to read that, that section of Hebrews chapter 10, 19 through 25. The primary reference in the Old Testament, you see this mysterious man, Melchizedek, is in Genesis 14 and 18, with another uh, reference found in, in Psalms 110 and 4. And there's a whole lot more information and also explanation to Melchizedek, which is the king of justice, in Hebrews chapter 7, verses 1 through 17. Read the whole lesson. You see, class, this lesson right here is again, it's kind of kind of deep. All we just all we're doing right now really is just kind of scratching the scratch. Is we're not we're not getting any kind of detail whatsoever. But but God's assurance is sure, and it's full assurance. And it's good to know that God's word is sure and true and st and stable and reliable, dependable, consistent, and his word cannot lie. And it's also good to know that Jesus came when he came, the, the veil was torn in half from top to bottom, and now we can go beyond the veil. Now we can go to the King of Kings, Lord of Lords, uh, for ourselves. No one has to go for you, for us. 
we can go for ourselves. And so let's learn again to, to lean and depend on God's word. Let's learn more about God's word. The way we learn more God, about God's word is by studying his word, praying and seeking for understanding. And he, never, he has never failed us yet, and he will never fail us. He'll never leave us and never forsake us. Hey, look, y'all have a great rest of the day. We we'll look to see you again next Sunday for our next Sunday School Review. Take care.